Good morning. How are we doing? Good. I think the, the rain's made us all a little... Uh, sleepy is probably not the right word. Um, relax. That's a good word. I, I don't know who said it, but I heard it out of the right ear over here. Relax. That's good. So uh, I'm excited that you're here. Really glad that you're here today. My name's Alex. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Fellowship Bible, and we are just glad that you've joined us on this day, uh, despite the rain. And I was reminding somebody, it has rained a lot um, in the short little, you know, time that I've lived here, really since the beginning of the year, um, but I was reminded that we'll be grateful for this come July and August, <laughs> you know. I was like, ah, oh, you're going to be glad that it was raining a lot, so looking forward to that first summer back in Texas. Um, just a couple of things before we dive in. First, our new associate pastor, Clay Smith, is finally in the house today, and so good to have you, brother. Yeah. He's a single man this week, so he's looking for people to invite him over for dinner and take care of him. Uh, then he'll be back in Lawrence for a week because his eldest graduates from high school in a couple of weeks, and so there's lots of festivities going on. Uh, then he'll be back for a week and then gone again, but the next time you come back, you'll come back with all your family on May the 29th, right after Memorial Day. And so, Clay, it's good to have you uh, we're glad that you're with us today. I want to thank Mark Rodell and the worship team. You know, if you've been with us for a while, James Johnson, who was uh, with us for about six months, uh, he and his wife Tanya headed to Minnesota for the summer. And so, Mark, thank you to, to you and the rest of the crew that's going to kind of hold things together for us over the summer. Yeah, you can clap for them. Um, and, and, and we're looking for a part-time worship leader. And so if you know somebody who lives in the area or you know somebody that knows somebody or maybe you're looking, you know somebody who wants to be bivocational, the job posting with the description and the applications on our website. And so if you just go to longviewfbc.com, go to the About Us, scroll down to job openings, uh, you'll find that there. We've had an applicant and applicant so far. Uh, and so hope to, to have a few more. And so we'll just keep you posted. Uh, as things move along in that area. And then finally, uh, with our adult classes, we're going to try something a little different this summer and, and try to build in a rhythm of breaks uh, here and there, both for our teachers uh, and those who serve so faithfully in our kids' ministry at the 9 o'clock hour. And so you'll see the kind of the summer schedule on the screen behind me right now. No classes coming up May 12th on Mother's Day next week, 19th or uh, the 26th. And then we're going to do two summer semesters with some book studies uh, and such. So those of you who participated in, uh, I forget the name of it, what was Del Tackett's study that you did? That, yeah, that, the Truth Project. Uh, we're doing part two to that, the Engagement Project. So that will uh, start in just a few weeks. But we're also doing a few book studies that I just want to make you aware of. And by the way, all this information uh, is on our website if you scan this QR code. Um, but we've got a couple of studies that, that we're doing. Uh, Who Am I by Jerry Bridges. Uh, Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Tim Keller, one of my favorites. Uh, and we're doing a book called Is God Anti-Gay? by a guy named Sam Alberry, and, and Sam is a same-sex attracted Christian, but he's celibate, uh, and he's got an incredible book. CJ, in fact, is going to lead uh, that study, and, uh, and, and we've had several of you uh, already just say something to us. Thank you so much for doing the study, because I have a friend, or I have a sibling, or I have a son, or I have a daughter, and so this is a very real issue and something that uh, our family is dealing with. And so uh, this class doesn't promise to give you all the answers, but does promise to uh, discuss the subject in a, a, a very healthy uh, and important way. And, and, and maybe, if nothing else, help you understand by attending that class that there's others like you who are dealing with the same things that uh, you're dealing with, with with your loved ones. And so anyway, uh, there's all kinds of information about all of our studies and, and the costs and links to pick up the books. They're pretty cheap. They're like, what, CJ, eight, nine, 10? Yeah, $12. What'd you say? I'm sorry. Yeah, after you sign up for the study, you'll get a link to be able to order the book. And so anyway, then we'll take a break for a couple of weeks in the middle of July and then pick it back up with some new studies uh, at the end of the summer in, in July and August. So anyway, as Toby said a little bit earlier, lots going on uh, around here. Um, well, today we are not 
starting a new series as much as we're jumping back into one. Uh, if you were with us back in the fall, we covered the first half of the book of Genesis. We, we got all the way through uh, from chapter 1 into chapter 25, ended with an incredible art show, and then we took a break. And so for about the last four or five months, we've been doing different studies, and so we're going to dive back into Genesis today and try to get all the way through chapter 50 around the end of July. As a quick recap, because I think we need a little summary to help catch us up, as a, a quick recap of where we've been thus far, um, week one, we talked about the creation of the world. We said that God created everything from nothing um, that humans were unique among God's creation, and we also said that everything was created for Jesus. Um, we said God created mankind. Uh, we believe, by the way, that Adam and Eve are real people, that we can uh, trace our family tree uh, all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. They uh, were not fictional characters, but they were real people, and um, we also said that sin entered the world uh, because of them. So sometimes we wish they weren't our parents. But sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. They were disobedient in the garden. And because of that, we said we all sin, we all hide, and we all blame. And then we spent a ton of time talking about the effects of that sin through various circumstances and, and, and people, people like Cain uh, and Abel. We, we talked about Noah and the flood. We talked about the Tower of Babel. And then... After you get through the first depressing 12 chapters, it just gets worse because we meet the first in the line of Old Testament patriarchs, a guy named Abram, who later becomes Abraham, and how seemingly random it was that God picks this guy, chooses this particular guy, who, by the way, wasn't even a follower uh, of his, but chooses him and makes him this incredible promise of land, descendants, and blessing unconditionally unilaterally and eternally. And how crazy that seemed because his wife Sarah was barren and couldn't have children. And so as we continue to follow their story, we see that they do indeed have two sons, the first of which was uh, by some terrible means through a sex slave. Do you remember that child's name? Yeah, Ishmael. And then they end up having another son because God is gracious to them, gives them a miracle baby of their own, a son named Isaac. And then finally we wrapped it up with the death of Abraham. And now we're going to pick it up today with the story of uh, Abraham's two grandsons, or Isaac's sons, Esau and Jacob. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip or tap your way over to Genesis chapter 25, return in your Genesis journal. Uh, I don't know what page that is, but to, to chapter 25, we will start in verse 19. And I'm just going to tell you, we're going to try to get through three chapters today. So just buckle up your seatbelts. Hang on. Here we go. Verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac. Abraham's son, Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled within her, struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Okay, so we're back into Genesis. We are back into the story. We've got Isaac and Rebecca, and she is pregnant. And so, uh, just something to point out here, in verse 22, when it says that the children struggled within her, that word struggled in the original language uh, means jostled. Um, it, um, it, it can also be translated as crushed. And, and so, basically, you get this picture of these two children, these twins that are uh, in her womb. They are, they are jostling. They are crushing one another. Uh, and this is called foreshadowing. <laughs> And because this was happening during the course of her pregnancy, she begins to cry out to God. And she's like, God, why is this happening? And he says, because, listen, you don't just have two babies in there. 
that there's something bigger at play. You have two nations uh, in there. There's two tribes in there. There's two peoples in there, and they're going to be divided. One's going to be stronger than the other, and the older is going to serve the younger. And so you may read that, and you don't think much of it, but I, I need to tell you that if you know anything about birthrights in Scripture, especially about this particular people, the Jewish people, historically and biblically speaking, that phrase just doesn't make any sense, the, the older serving the younger, right? Because when you're talking about birthrights in, in, in this day and time, uh, first of all, ladies, sorry, but, but the girls didn't get anything. I don't make the rules, um, but that's the way things were, and, and the boys got everything, and so if you had multiple boys, the older boy always got what was called a double blessing or a double portion. So let me give you an example. In my family, uh, there's three brothers. Roger and Della Alexander have three sons. My older brother is Robert. You might remember him. He was here with us back at Easter. Uh, I'm in the middle, and then we have a younger brother named Stephen. Stephen. And so when my parents, um, they're both still living, but let's just say they have uh, an inheritance, and, and, and when my parents pass, then basically what would happen, or when my dad, when my father passed away, uh, what would happen is, is that um, you would take all of their uh, wealth or everything that they own and their possessions, and you would divide it, not by three, you would divide it by four. And so my older brother, Rob, would, would get two quarters, or he would get half, uh, and then my younger brother, Stephen, and I, we would each get a quarter. Does that make sense? Because Rob would get a double blessing. Now, if you were me, so you have Robert being born, and then you have me being born, and there's just two sons, uh, when you are the second son, you just begin to pray like crazy that mom and dad have a third, right? Because cause if not, then the older brother gets everything, and I get nothing, and so this is how it worked. This is a, this is a double portion. This is a, a double blessing. And a birthright didn't just come with material inheritance or wealth. It also came with a spiritual inheritance. It came with this idea, the birthright did, that it gives the oldest son this ability to begin to act as the patriarch of the family. And they get this responsibility then to make decisions. Uh, they also have to take responsibility for the rest of the family. But, but they become the protector. They become the provider. Um, everyone knows <clears throat> how this works. But in this family, God is declaring that the person that was going to get the inheritance, who was going to be the protector, who was going to become the patriarch, was not the older. It was going to be the younger. And in this family, it's a much bigger deal than it is in other families because this inheritance came with it, this spiritual blessing. Do you remember the Abrahamic covenant that we talked about? That, that he gets this blessing of land, descendants, blessing unilaterally, unconditionally, eternally, no matter what. And that gets passed on from generation to generation. So this son who gets this blessing, this inheritance, gets the, the spiritual blessing of that covenant. And God said, in this instance, it's going to be the younger, not the older. Okay, let's meet these two boys, Esau and Jacob. Look at verse 24. It says, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Okay, something funny is happening here, and you wouldn't know this unless you knew the original language, but the name Esau, uh, Esau in Hebrew sounds like the word hairy. Um, so it's just kind of a, a play on words there. Uh, and, and so, listen, uh, you know when a baby, when a new baby's born and, and you meet that couple <clears throat> that has the new baby and you look at that baby that has a lot of hair on their head, right? And you go, oh, your baby has a lot of hair. That's kind of shocking, right? Because most times babies have no hair. Uh, this is not that, okay? This is that on steroids. I'm imagining something more like an orangutan, Okay, this, this baby's coming out like with, with red and hair and everywhere. And, and, and so they're super creative. They name this baby Harry. 
basically. <laughs> Seriously, that's, it's, this is what, it's, there's fun play on words that's happening in Scripture here. You're, you're going to see it again here. Uh, verse 26, afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when uh, she bore them. So the orangutan comes out, and then baby number two comes out, and he's named Jacob because Jacob sounds like the word heel uh, in Hebrew, and he's holding on uh, to Esau's heel. Um, this word also means to attack from behind or deceiver, and we're going to get there. Verse 27, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Okay, <clears throat> this is like classic, almost cliche tension where Esau, you get the picture that Esau is this manly man, right? He is the hunter, he is the fisherman. If he lived in this day and time, he would drive a pickup truck and enjoy watching MMA, right? That's who he is. And dad loved him uh, because he was good with the bow. And so he could go out and, and he could kill uh, dinner in the way, um, you know, to a man's heart is through his stomach. And so this son could go and hunt and kill game and prepare food. And, and so his dad loved him. He loved Esau the most. And then you've got Jacob. He did not love the outdoors. He is what I like to call the great indoorsman. He liked to stay inside in the tent with mom. And so what we have here is we have this picture of the parents playing favorites with their sons. Now, practically at first glance, you look at these two and you think the older is going to be the leader, right? Like this just makes sense. This is the guy who you think would be the patriarch and the protector of the family. And yet God's already declared that the older is going to serve the younger. And you could just feel the tension building in the narrative. Skips forward, verse 29. We don't know when this happened. This is like one day, once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom, because Edom just means red. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright. Now... Esau said, I'm about to die. I'm so hungry. I'm so famished. So what good is my birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In other words, it just means he doesn't care. It means that when Esau looked at the promise that God had made his grandpa, the promise of land, descendants, and blessing unilaterally, unconditionally, and eternally, um, it meant nothing to him compared to how hungry he was in that moment. And he's about to get hungrier because a famine's come into the land that rivaled the famine that, um, that, that Abraham had faced. Again, for those of you who were with us in the fall, remember that time uh, Abraham was in the desert and, and famine came their way. And instead of being obedient to God and staying where he was supposed to stay, he said, you know, I've got to escape this. I've got to go where some food is. Let's go down to Egypt for a while. They get down to Egypt. He um, tells everyone that his wife is his sister, right? And he sells his wife to Pharaoh. Then after the famine's over, they decide to come back uh, north. He comes back to the promised land. Then he sells his wife again to King Abimelech. And, and so God says to his son, Isaac, there's a famine coming. Don't go to Egypt. I want you to stay here. Look, this is chapter 26, verse 2. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your offspring, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. This is positive. Right? This is progress. Um, God's like, listen, Isaac, do not go down to Egypt like your father did. And he stayed, right? So far, so good. Verse 7. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking, lest the men of this place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. Okay, seriously, what is it with this family? <laughs> right? Here's what it is. It's like father, like son stuff going on here. And, and, and they can't get out of their own way. And so in verse 8, when he'd been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Okay, now, for those of you who have uh, ESV Bible, you might see a little footnote um, right there uh, next to the word laughing. If you follow that footnote down, this is what it says. It says, laughing may suggest an intimate relationship. And, and, and so, uh, this was not laughing, per se. This was like a, a flirty, uh, a flirtatious thing. So, the king's looking out the window, and he sees uh, who he thinks is a, a brother and sister, kind of like, you know, giving, being sweet on one another, canoodling. Um, where, like, I'm just trying to find a, a, a fun kind of way to say they were just like laughing, but it was, you know, a little bit more intimate than he just told her a funny dad joke, Right? So basically, the king sees Isaac and Rebekah being sweet on each other. Verse 9. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she's your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you've done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So, again, it's, it's like same story, second verse, you know, all over again. King Abimelech says to Isaac, I want you to stay here. After this, he's like, I want you to stay here, uh, stay in the land. Um, we're just going to leave each other alone. We're going to have a peace treaty with one another. And at this point in the story, um, Isaac becomes incredibly wealthy. In fact, it says within the span of one year, his wealth grew 100-fold. Now, that might not sound a, like a lot to you, but, but just for example, it'd be like last year if you'd put 10K uh, in your 401K, uh, and then you woke up 12 months later and there was a million dollars in there. You'd be like, oh, that's a lot, right? And, and so his wealth, he was already wealthy, and, and now he's like Elon Musk, you know, wealthy. That's what's going on here. And then God reminds Isaac why he gets this blessing. Verse 24, God says, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you, and I will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. In other words, God's just reminding him, listen, none of this wealth, none of this influence that you've been given, none of this power is because of you. He's like, it's because I made a promise to your dad. I made a promise to your father. That's why you're successful, because I'm a God who keeps his promises. Okay, so let's get back to the two boys in the story. Um, at this point, Isaac's gotten so old and feeble, he's lost his eyesight. And if you read through the beginning of, of chapter 27 here, you see that Isaac calls for his favorite son, Esau. And he says, Esau, listen, I'm about to die. And before I do... Here's what I'd love for you to do. Uh, I'd love for you to go out on another hunt. And I'd like for you to take your bow and arrow and go kill something and bring it back to me. And that'll be, you know, like my last meal. Uh, and not only that, when you go kill something, you come back and you prepare it and you cook it and you bring it to me. I'm finally going to give you that blessing uh, from father to son. I'm going to give you uh, a blessing because you're my eldest, you're my firstborn. So Esau goes, man, he puts on his camo, he sprays himself down with the scent blocker, he grabs his bow, he goes and does some killing. And the problem is, mom overhears this whole thing. And she goes and finds Jacob, the great endorsement, and she says, honey, I know you could never kill anything, 
So go get me a couple of goats and bring them to me, and I'll kill the goats. I'll make your dad's favorite meal, uh, and then I'll give it to you. You'll take it to him, and he's going to think that uh, you're uh, his other son, Esau, uh, and then you'll get the blessing. And I absolutely love uh, his response. Here's Jacob's response to his mom, verse 11. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, he'll touch me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. So he's kind of smart. He's like, Mom, there's no way Dad's fallen for this. This is dumb. We should not be doing this. Uh, my skin is smooth as a baby's bottom. Dad's going to figure this out, and when he does, he's going to curse me. This is not going to go well. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. And so she's commanding her 40-year-old son to obey her, and he does it. He brings her goats. She kills the goats. While she's cooking the meal, she takes the hair of, of, the, of the goats, the goat skin. She makes a goat hair suit for her son because apparently goat hair feels exactly like an orangutan. <laughs> now listen, this is an important part of the story. She makes this goat suit to cover his hands and his neck and everything, and then she puts it on top of him. And, and, and so she's like, um, she, she does that, probably gets some of Esau's stinky, dirty camo you know, clothes, puts it on him. You have the image, right? Verse 18. So he went into his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat uh, of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. He blesses Jacob. And here's the blessing. Verse 28. Here's the blessing he pronounces. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let the peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. And so with that blessing, he now gets out of there ASAP. I mean, when you read the narrative, it's almost like you get this mental picture that they, they, they just sort of like pass each other in the hallway. Jacob gets the blessing. Uh, he leaves. It's like, you know, it's just a matter of time before dad finds this out, before the plan falls apart. And, and so I'm going to leave. Uh, and then Esau's returning uh, from the hunt. And, and, and so it's just sort of like maybe, you know, they saw each other kind of coming and going here. Verse 33 well, actually, before that, you know, Esau shows up, and Dad, I brought you the meal. Um, and his dad says, what? It can't be. Verse 33, then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. Every time I read this, um, it's just always a little bit odd to me. It, I just, I want to go, why didn't he just say, who deceived me? You know, why didn't he just say, hey, you know what? This will not stand up in a court of law. I'm going to get my attorneys. Like, somebody just came in here. Uh, there was highway robbery that just occurred. It's like, why didn't he speak up and say something? And I think what happens in this moment is 40 years of this prophecy that God gave it's just kind of been rolling around, right? And, and, and the older is going to serve the younger. And I think that just finally settles in. And he realizes God's going to have his way. Verse 34. 
As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he's taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? I mean, listen, just imagine you're Esau. You've lived your entire life as dad's favorite. You're waiting for this moment. I'm going to guess he probably knew uh, about the covenant with, with his grandfather. I mean, we don't know that for certain, but I'm just going to suppose for a second. He probably knows about this covenant. He he knows about this blessing, and he's going to be the one to receive the blessing. And now he's got nothing. And so he's like, Dad, have you not left anything for me? And then Isaac gave him what theologians call, and this is just tragic, but they call it an anti-blessing. Look at this. Verse 39. Then Isaac, his father, answered him and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning from my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. I mean, it doesn't get any more personal than to say you're going to kill someone and use their name, does it? It's like, I'm going to kill Jacob. I'm going to stomp him into the ground just as soon as dad is gone. And the problem is, is mom overhears this because moms hear everything. And she tells her son, get out of here. I want you to go see uh, my brother, your uncle Laban. I want you to go chill at his house for a while until everything calms down, and that's where we'll pick it up next week. But you know, it's really easy to read a story like this and think, these are terrible people. Like, mom and dad don't appear to plan anything together. They don't work well together. The brothers don't get along. But I think there's something deeper going on here. I think Jacob felt like he had to become someone else in order to receive a blessing from his father. For me, one of the most heartbreaking moments is when Jacob leans down to get a kiss from his dad and he gets a kiss and a blessing because his dad thinks he's someone else. So that kiss, that blessing must have come with a dagger. To to know that the only way that I'm going to get this kiss and I'm going to get this blessing is if my dad thinks I'm somebody else. See, the problem is sometimes becoming someone else works. Some of you have done this. You've pretended to be someone else in order to receive the blessing from your parents or in order to receive the the blessing from a sibling or from a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse. We put on something else, we put on someone else in order to receive what we might not receive otherwise. And it's sad because we we not only do this with one another, but oftentimes we do this with God. We, we, We try to put on something else in order to try to hide who we really are from God. I mean, maybe you're here today for the first time. Somebody's invited you, or maybe it's been a long time. 
since you've been in the doors of the church. And so when you got that invite, you're kind of like thinking to yourself, oh man, you know, I got to go to church. I mean, I got to look good. Maybe I got to put something on. I got to wear something. I kind of look nice. I need to cover myself up because otherwise these people might not accept me. I got to clean myself up before I get there into the sanctuary, into the worship center, and I'm exposed. And the good news of the gospel eventually breaks through that into our lives. I mean, we've all been there, right? And, and so that the good news of the gospel breaks through that, and we, we ask the Lord to, to be our Savior. And then what do we do? We say, well, now that I'm a Christian, i got to clean up my act. God certainly can't use me the way that I am. I better become someone else. It's tragic. I love what Tim Keller um, writes about this particular story. He says this. Uh, God bless the most screwed up member of the whole family. Why? Why? Because the moral of the story is God brings his scandalous intervening grace into the lives of people who don't seek it, don't deserve it, continually resist it, and don't even appreciate it after they've been saved by it over and over and over again. The first thing Isaac gets a grip on and the first thing that you and I have to get a grip on if we're going to deal with our problem of blessing is that when God works, he works sheerly through grace. See, the good news of the gospel is that God sent his son Jesus. He loves you so much. He loves me so much. He loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to save you and me, flaws and all. God loves you so much that he sent his only son to earth to live a a sinless life, died on the cross, paid the penalty of our sin, and listen, he becomes the garment of righteousness that we now put on. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans and Galatians says that for those of us who place our faith in Jesus, he says, we put on Christ. And that phrase, put on, is the same word in the original language that means like putting on your shirt. It's putting on a garment. And so the difference between us and Jacob is when we come to God the Father with all of our sin, wearing this Jesus suit, and we come before his throne, he he looks at us and he says, Bill, or Alex, or Janice, you look just like my son. You smell just like him. And there's no deception there. Because when he sees us, he sees us through his son. He loves you. He sees you through Jesus' righteousness. We have a good and gracious king, amen? Amen. At FBC, we have a rhythm of receiving communion on the first Sunday of the month. And so as the servers are beginning to prepare the elements and coming forward, I want to give you some brief instruction. Um, We started something new uh, last month. Uh, And so if you were here when we took communion last month, you just need to know that there's two cups uh, that are there. There's a, a cup stacked inside of a cup, and so the, the top cup is filled with juice, and then the bottom cup has a little wafer in it, and so as the plate comes by, you'll just, you'll just grab, you're going to grab two cups at, at one time. Does that make sense? They're stacked, one right on top of the other. Uh, and, and so when uh, the, the plate passes, you just grab one little stack of two cups there, and then you'll pass it on to the person um, next to you. And once you receive those, if you'll just hold on to them, we'll all take them together. 
In fact, at FBC, we practice what is commonly referred to as open communion, and so you don't have to be uh, a member or a partner uh, of our church. Come on forward, servers, if you want to. Um, you don't have to be a partner or a member of our church. You just have to have previously uh, made a profession of faith and put your trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you haven't done that yet, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, any healthy church uh, ought to have people in it who have yet to give their life to Christ. And if that's you, again, super excited that you're here. We hope that you were moved by the service today. We would just kindly ask as the, the plate passes that you would just um, let that pass. Nobody will think anything uh, different about you. Uh, in fact, they'll probably be praying for you in a positive way. And so with that instruction, let's now prepare our hearts to receive communion. Uh, and in doing so, remember the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 11, who said this, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so as the servers begin to pass the elements, let's take just a moment and examine ourselves. Thank you. I also need to uh, mention for those that were looking for the gluten-free uh, elements, they're also uh, available in the back of the room. And so if you would prefer that, uh, you can just get up from where you are and uh, come right back here uh, to the back of the room. Communion offers us a special opportunity um, to regularly remember Jesus Christ who suffered death upon a cross uh, for our redemption, who by his sacrifice um, offered once and for all a full and perfect payment for the sins of the entire world. And so uh, we remember so we might follow the way uh, of Jesus so that we um, would follow in his footsteps and become more and more like him. And so in light of this, we come to his table now in obedience uh, to continue a perpetual memory uh, of this act until he comes again. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup and we had given thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing. We thank you uh, for the blessing that is poured out on Jacob, even though he is the most messed up person in the story that doesn't really deserve any of it. We thank you that as you said to him over and over and over, you're doing this because you'd made a promise with Abraham, and you're a God who keeps his promises. And so we thank you that you keep your promises not only towards those in the Old Testament and these stories that we read, but that you keep your promises to us, and that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to become our righteousness, to make us acceptable to you, so that you can look at us and say, you look just like my son, Jesus. We pray this in his name, in his name alone. Amen. 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 Uh, I hope you'll come back uh, next week as we continue the story. We uh, get into the part where uh, Jacob has a, a dream about a ladder uh, or a stairway to heaven. That may sound familiar to you especially from Vacation Bible School. It's one of those stories that we uh, love to tell. Uh, and so hope you'll come back next week for that. It's also Mother's Day, and so moms, when we say that there will be a candy bar, we didn't mean that there would be like a candy bar, although I think you've gotten a candy bar in the past, but I actually mean a bar with all kinds of candies on it so that you can walk through and like fill your little, uh, you'll have a little box or something that you can fill with candy. So it's like a candy bar. Yeah, not a candy bar. Hmm. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, you just have to come back next week and see. Uh, and we do, uh, one lucky mom's going to win like a little gift certificate for uh, like at True La Wellness Spa. And so anyway, it's going to be a great day. Hope you'll come back and join us for that. If you're here today and you just like to pray with somebody, maybe you're here today and you feel like the gospel message is just uh, penetrating uh, your heart today that the Holy Spirit was working uh, in your life, and you would like to come and pray with somebody or just talk uh, with somebody about what it means to, to be a Christ follower, just to share something with them and get a few words of prayer uh, while you're here. There'll be a group down here uh, at these steps at the altar, as we like to call it, after the service. So feel free to come on down. Would you stand with me and let's read our benediction? Together you'll see these words on the screen. May the love of Christ be active in your heart, be heard in your words, be seen in your actions, and inform your choices today and all days. Amen. You're dismissed.